recording is starting now and we can start also the webinar uh, if you agree so good morning everybody thank you for uh, joining us uh, in this webinar and uh, first thank you to professor bowen who uh, decided to accept our, our invitation and uh, thank you for his generous contribution to our uh, project um uh, I would I want just to introduce briefly Professor Bowen. Some of you, of course, uh, already know for his work. Um, he's a professor of social cultural policy at the uh, Washington <laughs> University in, um, in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, he did uh, uh, researches about the social transformation of. Uh, uh, Muslim uh, Muslim communities uh, in uh, Indonesia in, uh, um, in in several European countries, <coughs> with a network of researchers also in uh, Africa and Middle East. And uh, uh, his work analyzes how Muslims, uh, both uh, common citizens and uh, uh, and highly educated scholars, uh, use their sources. Uh, uh, of norms and values uh, to interpret and authorize uh, specific uh, specific traditions, rules, social norms, and daily practices. Uh, among uh, his works, uh, uh, there are some theoretical uh, books, such as uh, uh, bestsellers uh, like religious, uh, Religions in Practice and A New Anthropology of Islam, and uh, several works about uh, European contexts, uh, such as on British Islam or France after Charlie Hebdo. Um, and in, uh, uh, in his theoretical contribution to this to the anthropology, anthropological study of uh, Islam, uh, Professor Bowen's, uh, Bowen uh, conceives uh, Islam as a set of resources and uh, interpretive practices, resources such as text, ideas, methods that allow Muslim, uh, Muslims to think of uh, themselves as a global community linked to, to a long tradition that dates back to the first uh, Muslim communities. And uh, uh, the interpretive practices are related to worship, to, um, to struggle, to judgment, or daily to daily life, uh, for instance, uh, the halal regulation he is talking about uh, today are among these daily practices related with this uh, tradition. Um, and a central central concern is in his work uh, is about the concept of uh, adaptation, the adaptation the adaptation that allows um, Muslims to. Uh, to transform, to change uh, their practices despite the, the, the difference of the place and the cultural context where uh, they live. Um, and so um, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this process of the adaptation, the, um, the tensions that uh, emerge in, uh, in the practices and, uh, and interpretation of of their uh, practice are uh, um, the tensions between particular and what is particular and what is shared, between what is creative and what, what is compulsory, uh, and so on. So the halal regulation, regulations as uh, performative acts uh, is, uh, that is the, 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 the topic of the, of the of Professor Bowen's talk today, is about this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, of, of concepts and the, 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 what what happens in the struggle, the, say in the in the time between the different these different poles. But before um, before uh, the uh, professor Bowen uh, talk, uh, our principal investigator, Professor Palumbo, is going to to introduce the the, um, the progress of uh, our research uh, program. And uh, by the way, I just saw that uh, some uh, of our um, uh, of our uh, colleagues uh, just joined, uh, namely Professor Mirizzi and uh, Professor Zanotelli and uh, um, Dr. Santoro and so on. So thank you for joining us. We are recording the meeting. So if, if everybody agrees, uh, we can do that. Uh, Maratushi is coming. She called me by telephone. 
Okay. Uh, thank you, Domenico. I'm very happy, and we are very happy to 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 see and to listen uh, uh, John John Bowen uh, and. Uh, I'm sorry, I had something in my mind and I forgot it. But we are very happy to have you here and to listen to your, uh, your seminar. Um, I'm not sure that I can do any, any summary of our uh, state of work because we have had some problems uh, because of the impossibility or difficulty to make field research during the the pandemic period and uh, in some way we have to change our uh, proposal uh, what i can do is to make one two or three points concerning the the thematic area of each unit which are the the units which compose our project as you probably know are uh, the unit of uh, university of basilicata where uh, Ferdinando Mirizzi and Domenico Copertino uh, are the main uh, the investigator. And uh, the University of Palermo, uh, I see here on, uh, just uh, Vicini. Uh, and I know that some other people are coming uh, into our meet, uh, in particular Professor uh, uh, D'Agostini and Professor Fava. The third unit uh, is the unit of Catania, and I see here uh, Giovanni Cordova and Mara Benaduzzi, uh, our colleague Mara, is, she is coming uh, uh, in a few minutes. Then there is the, the unit of Messina, and I see here myself and uh, Francesco Zanotelli. Uh, yes. Concerning uh, the, the advancement of our uh, field work and our work, I think that uh, the, the people who are ah, Mara is here. Uh, the people who are working in a more intensive way are the, the, the young assignisti. Uh, so the people we have uh, uh, assumed in order to to make field work. And uh, I know that Giovanni Cordova is working uh, here in the area of Messina with Singalese uh, people who are here since many years, and uh, in the way they are entering or not entering the, the Catholic rituals, because many of them are Catholics. Uh, Mara Benaduzzi, uh, she's here now. It's, I think that she, if she wants, she can add something to what I am saying about the unity of uh, Catania. But she has, she's a specialist of uh, Sri Lanka and uh, she's, she has worked and she's still working on the, some kind of rituals we, we, which implies the possibility that uh, bones uh, and relics of uh, historical Italian and uh, Sicilian signs go and go to Sri Lanka, coming back to Italy and so on. Uh, then uh, there is the University of Palermo, Vicin, uh, where is... Uh, uh, University of Palermo, they too are working on rituals uh, involving uh, both Singalese uh, people and uh, other uh, people coming from other parts of, uh, of uh, Asia. Uh, which are involved in the complex ritual systems of uh, Palermo City. Domenico Copertino, as you probably know, and you have spoken with him, I know, uh, he, he is working and is planning to uh, enlarge his work, to extend his work on the Muslim in the, in the Puglia, uh, Muslim communities in the Puglia, which is a, a southern Italian uh, region area, and uh, in particular in, in Bari and I hope in, uh, in Trani, which is another town too. Uh, and Ferdinando is, is planning to work on rituals in some villages in, uh, in uh, the Basilicata area, 
And uh, I hope we can also work on, on a topic uh, on which I'm working too, which is the reinvention of uh, Jewish identity in in a, in a, in a, in a Napoleon uh, city that has reopened and answered the synagogue. So there are people who are coming back, they say, to Judaism. And uh, at the same time, the reemergence of memory of uh, Eucharistic miracles, which comes from the medieval area and are re reactivated. It seems that they are reactivated by now, probably because of the reemergence of, uh, of the Jewish presence in that area. So by and large, these are the topics we are working to trying to adapt to the to the pandemic situation which has impeded till now since two years uh, the possibility to make public rituals which were in origin our first topics so we hope to analyze the way that rituals operate in, in, in concrete situation and this is impossible by now because all uh, public catholic rituals have been uh, uh, blocked by the church. So we are trying to adapt our interest and our topics to the situation. And in, anyway, we are very happy to have you here and uh, to have the possibility to, to listen to you. And uh, I thank you in name of all the people of the, of the group. Thank you, Professor Palumbo. Uh, and just let me say once more thank you to Professor Bowen. Uh, so you heard the uh, updating uh, about our uh, the progress of our research. And so uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I, it's a great honor to be <clears throat> speaking to this impressive group. I, I'm especially impressed by the comparative nature of your project, comparative across uh, areas. Uh, within a delimited region and also comparative across faith traditions and situations. This is very healthy. It's, it's one of the great things I think about the European tradition of research in general, this tendency to fund larger comparative projects. I think it's really, really good. We all face this challenge in the time of COVID of, of investigating uh, in the field, and, but also in your case, it's particularly unfortunate because as you explained, uh, you're you're uh, you're interested in public events, and of course, public events are are not happening, or they're very limited. Um, uh, what, one of the thoughts I had, uh, I'll just uh, share it before I start uh, my own my own talk, lest I forget it later on, is that it might be a good time to investigate the uh, uh, to the extent you can the, the legal and historical bases for the implant implantation of migrants and uh, notions of public space in particular. Uh, challenges to uh, Italian notions, uh, Italian usages of public space that might be posed by immigrant groups, <clears throat> uh, problems they face in using public space in, in, a new, in a new land. A lot of this could be done through, through uh, interviews, uh, con consultation of historical and legal documents, uh, perhaps even court cases that have come up around, for example, the uh, uh, public uh, practices of halal slaughter, something I'm happy to, to be working on now, but of course, in, in terms of the construction of mosques, the visibility of mosques, uh, uh, the issues that come up in across Europe that, that could be pursued in, during this time. But I, I'm, in, I'm in no position, I'm sure, to advise you. I'm sure you've thought through all these issues. It was just, uh, I thought I'd share this thought that came to me at, at the moment. But we, we share um, uh, an interest in the ways in which migrants, and in my case, Muslim migrants, to Europe recreate familiar institutional contexts. In this case, regarding halal food and boundaries. And also, we, we're always attuned to surprises, unexpected consequences. Uh, let, let me just pause for a moment and make sure that uh, I'm coming across clearly. I'm not speaking too fast or slowly. Uh, Domenico, is, is everything good on your end? I think it's OK. Technically, it's perfect. Uh, and also, I, I think your uh, way of speaking, we, we, we can understand. Uh, okay, good. As as Thank you. Can <clears throat> so, uh, if for hundreds of years, Muslims prepared their foods and ate them, perhaps after a blessing, in recent decades, there have arisen formalized procedures to determine whether or not a product is halal, admissible to Muslims, 
These procedures involve bodies that issue certificates attesting to the halal quality of a food product, a cosmetic, or other goods. In several Muslim-majority countries, notably Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Gulf states, state bodies play this role to authorize or, or authorize others to do so. Elsewhere, it falls to private bodies to, to create these halal certification or audit services. And this is what I'll be talking about today. What does this mean locally? I know you're very interested in, in locality, in home, and in space, as am I. The local butcher who for years sold meat assumed by all to be halal because he was, after all, a Muslim and of good character, might now post a sticker attesting to the halal quality of the meat, and the shop may also carry packaged goods, local or imported, that carry a halal stamp issued by a trusted international certifier. <clears throat> this sticker identifies consumer goods and, um, sorry, identifying consumer goods as halal can be highly profitable. While estimates of the value of the worldwide market for halal products vary widely, they are all in the hundreds of billions of US dollars. And what is relatively recent is the notion that there is such a thing as a global halal market, which can be assigned a total market value. That in itself is a, is a change. Now, what changed to cause the, this, 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 new, this new emergence of certification services? Mainly three things. First, by the 1970s, Muslim majority countries found themselves importing more and more goods from countries that were not themselves majority Muslim. Malaysians and Indonesians were buying packaged goods and medicines from Chinese sources, and countries in the Middle East were buying meat from Europe. Business was conducted through multiple intermediaries. Impersonal, interpersonal trust no longer could be relied on to guarantee that these imports were free of elements that would make them not halal. Inevitably, scandals arose often involving the contamination of food or medicine with pork products. These fears gave rise to a demand for Islamic bodies that could attest to or certify the halal quality of an imported good. That's the first change, this rise in importation. Secondly, and at about the same time, a new generation of Muslims came of age in countries of recent immigration, especially Western Europe. They were less likely to live in circles entirely of immigrant families of the same origin. They were eager to try the same foods that their Dutch, French, or American schoolmates ate. Some of them were learning about Islam in an intellectual way by attending <coughs> lectures given by famous preachers or visiting prestigious Islamic websites. These works tended to present the matter of halal as about following general rules, rather than, as before, trusting people who came from your village. Third, so this is interest in explicit rules. Third, a new interest in diverse qualities of foods was rising. Organic foods, non-GMO products, locally produced foods, and along with these other interests in qualities, halal foods. By the 2010s, some Muslim consumers and producers had begun to promote foods as halal wal taib, or halal and good. These efforts were met with some pushback and conflicts in France over whether a food product could be certified as both halal and organic went to the European Court of Justice in 2019, where opponents of that dual certification won, mainly on grounds that stunning was practiced, or, or slaughter without stunning was practiced in halal food production, and that this ran counter to European norms of animal welfare. So the, 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 the French effort to have halal products certified as organic was, was turned down on, on principle, general principle grounds. These changes, anxiety over imports, desires for objective measures of halalness, and a broadening of halal, from avoiding pollution to creating the good, supported the rise of multiple efforts to test and attest to the halal character of consumer goods. These new institutions of halal certification are decentralized, even when they rely on each other's findings. And despite the global nature of their charge, they reflect national priorities and concerns. So, so they're both worldwide, but also locally shaped. French, British, and Dutch halal certifiers are part of French, British, and Dutch histories. The book that I'm completing draws on recent field work in the Netherlands, Britain, and France, and to a lesser extent, Indonesia and the United States, and concerns these initiatives and institutions 
intended to prove halal in the double sense of testing and demonstrating, analyzing and persuading. How do such institutions arise? And to what extent do they carry their birthmarks with them in a kind of cultural, perhaps national, path dependency? In what ways do they develop in response to global markets? What technical procedures have they developed to convincingly demonstrate that something is or is not halal? What are the pertinent rhetorics of proof? These are questions I'm asking that are of broad interest and could be applied to your various subjects of research as well. In studying these efforts, I look for the devices, that's a technical term in material semiotics, that actors use to prove an item as halal. By device, I tend to bring in material semiotic approaches to how we establish or perform claims. For example, the approaches adopted in economic sociology by Michel Calon, Olaf Welthaus, and others. These studies focus on how a certificate, a rating, or, or a brand name can compensate for an actor's limited knowledge by serving as what are called judgment devices or trust devices. This is a phrase from Lucien Karpik. Devices can substitute for direct knowledge uh, of how good a wine is or a piece of electronic might be, electronic equipment might be, or whether a lawyer or accountant is to be trusted, or as here, whether meat sold as halal beef is really halal or is indeed really beef. Personal networks can serve as trust devices Indeed, this is how people have navigated their way through uncertainty for most of human history. More formalized and objectified devices may emerge in those cases where personal networks lose their effectiveness, where the matter requiring knowledge is outside the ken of personal networks. Your friends may know from experience whether to trust the local butcher, but they will likely know little directly about how imported sausage is made. These ideas also reach back to Michel Foucault's use of dispositif <clears throat> to refer to complexes of categories, objects, and practices that define and regulate a particular domain of social life. Other terms, such as the French épreuve or rich or trial, add to this particular understanding of a device as featuring a series of fixed procedures, as in a legal trial or an experimental protocol, or as here, a series of tests and inspections. A verdict, written and pronounced, an account and evidence of a molecule, or the issuance of a halal certifi certificate all embody and at the same time index the successful working through of this series of events. For me, uh, as Domenico quite nicely uh, summarized, and Domenico, thank you so much for your summary of my work. I, since it's recorded, I will print and use that in the future. It was very nicely done. For me, the success, this particular line of inquiry has been part of broader efforts to understand how some Muslims have created new Islamic institutions in a way that is adapt adaptive to changing demands and constraints, such as law-like courts, schools, and here, food regulation devices. Of particular importance are questions of both national and Islamic legitimacy. Felicity conditions, to use Austin's term, for performative acts that create new statuses and qualities, such as married, divorced, or halal. Now I want to talk, say something about migration and Islamic institutions, and in particular, the, uh, 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 an argument that there's a paradox involved when you make rules explicit. So here's my argument. When Muslims migrate to new places, they face two interrelated challenges in their desire to live as Muslims. First, and most evident, they work to create institutions to address their immediate needs. Mosques for prayer, schools for religious education, tribunals to resolve disputes, including marital ones, and sources of halal foods and other consumer goods. But secondly, this is the second challenge, the very presence of these new institutions compel Muslims to explicitly decide what the appropriate rules and practices are, questions that often were simply assumed in their homelands. And furthermore, they must ask how to decide if a divorce has taken place a prayer has been properly performed, or the subject of this talk, a consumer good is halal. So this is the paradox of making rules explicit. You didn't have to do it before, and now, and now you have to in this new context. Here's the irony. Creating new halal inspections also has created new worries. Local trust is replaced by formalized trust procedures. The availability and expansion of halal inspection procedures 
may augment the sense of making home, finding ways to live as a Muslim in new lands, but it also creates a new need to have demonstrations of the halal quality of foods and other goods. And not only in migration contexts, I asked Yossi from Indonesia, who works as an inspector in Halal Correct, a Dutch halal certification body, why there seem to be more concerns about halal now in her native Indonesia, for example. She cited two reasons, far more foreign restaurants and foreign goods, for example, cosmetics than before. And secondly, those selling halal products uh, or com air commercials about the danger of for dangers of foreign goods and the need to buy only certified halal goods, and they ramp up the concern. A recent Indonesian law saying that all products must be certified have, as halal have led to unusual cases, such as the hijab. It was the sellers of these halal hijabs that sowed doubt in people's minds about their own hijabs. This was silly, said Yossi. How could it not be halal? But, she added, other, uh, other new goods really do need to be tested, such as, and this is the, true in the case of halal hijabs, uh, softeners for washing, for example. They contain fatty acids that, they, that we then need to check. So the ramping up of, of concerns and worries about halal status. And now adaptations. New halal bodies in different countries emphasize different aspects of their work. They adapt to local conditions, even as they depend on validation by halal authorities in far-flung far places. <clears throat> in Europe, for example, I've been working across several countries. Often the halal bodies across countries have worked with and learned from each other, but they also differ along national lines. For example, the Dutch focus on export markets, the general Dutch focus on export markets. Uh, and the, the Dutch are plugged into the highest status global halal bodies, especially those in Indonesia and Malaysia. By contrast, France generally focuses on the domestic market and is historically developed as a way of assuring French Muslims that their meat was halal. British bodies work with ethnic networks as organizing frameworks. A major service, uh, HMC, Halal Monitoring Committee, with which I work, works to promote the market itself. They work alongside producers. I focus on four uh, halal certification bodies, the uh, HMC, Halal Monitoring Committee in Britain, in uh, the, that's based in Leicester, in France, ABS or Abotel Service, at your service, near Paris, and two such bodies in the Netherlands, HQC or Halal Quality Control and HC or Halal Correct. I, I realize these, these, these initials resemble each other <clears throat> I won't, I won't uh, refer to them, I hope, too much. So the British body, HMC, often acts as a business advisor to the same companies they inspect and is always looking for ways to raise the value it brings to clients. For example, the director of HMC advises producers that show the HMC label to raise their prices because price signals quality. And prices also signal the value of the HMC brand. The extension of, of inspections into the restaurants gives HMC an additional register on which to uh, signal niche status. In this sense, HMC is playing on two registers at once, status and piety, and it works alongside this business community. This is very different from the other certification services I'm looking at. When HMC was created in Britain, France's Avotro Service, or AVS, advise them on techniques of avoiding contamination, and they resemble each other in many ways. Uh, they focus on fresh meat. They both extend inspection into the restaurants, and they look at production mainly for domestic consumption. Both bodies sought to bring greater rigor to halal inspections in their native countries, in their respective countries, but as it was developing its brand, AVS also sought to develop a broad image of piety alongside their, their reliability in the, in the matter of halal, as seen in their then physical proximity in Saint-Denis near Paris. They were next to the, the Tawhid bookstore and they were next to the office of Tariq Ramadan, uh, who you certainly know. Fuad Imarin, who was the director of ABS, the halal service, was also the imam working, serving for uh, congregational prayers held on the bookstore's 
premise. So there, there was this attempt to construct a space that signaled piety and linked piety to halal certification. And indeed, there's a focus in France in general on usages of public space that are not considered important in Britain or the Netherlands. And this, this has negative effects on halal as well. Uh, France in general remains wary, more than elsewhere in Western Europe, of the public presence of Islam. For example, in 2020, while waging the government's new campaign against its Islamic forms of what they call separatism, French interior minister Gérard Darmanin complained on television that he was frequently shocked to enter a supermarket and see a shelf of what he called communalist food, cuisine communautaire. Darmanin later expanded on his remarks, clarifying that he did not the right, deny the right to eat halal foods and kosher products. These were the communalist foods in question. But he regretted that capitalist profit seekers uh, advertised foods intended only for one segment of society in such a public way, and even worse, in food shops patronized by all sorts of people. This advertising of products of, as halal, according to the minister, weakened the republic by encouraging separatism. Of course, despite the intentional vagueness of the term communalist, few would have thought that the minister had kosher pizzas in mind. Rather, he was signaling his annoyance at the myriad ways that after headscarves in schools, and on the Catalan jogging outfits, Muslims were once again publicly holding back on their commitment to the Republic. By contrast, in Britain, HMC plays no such public religious role, though it seeks advice from Sharia scholars, nor do the two Dutch bodies, the Dutch Halal Correct certifiers, or the other service close to HMC in the sense that both stress, stress greater rigor in inspection standards vis-a-vis -vis those followed by their competitors. But as is the case with other major Dutch, Dutch halal certif certifiers, HC, halal correct, works with clients who are oriented towards export. And therefore, their overriding concern is their own compliance with specific halal standards required by the importing countries, especially Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Gulf states. This pragmatic orientation towards overseas clients demands the general key to Dutch economic success overrides any tendency to signal either piety or social status. So this general, this general point is that the form that these new institutions of the halal certification take, something we might think would be a universal set of concerns and practices, actually adapts very closely to previously existing patterns of religion and trade uh, in, the, in these three countries. And I expect you will find this in Italy as well. So it's a, it's a good question to ask. What are the distinctive features of Italian mosques, certification services, religious schools, in contrast to those found in France, Britain, or the Netherlands, et cetera. I think we can use the term ritual when discussing these halal practices and their evaluations in three senses of ritual. First, when Islamic ritual in a narrow sense is involved, this would be, the, the, this would be uh, rituals of ibadah or, or worship, uh, such as for animal slaughter, pronouncing the bismillah at the moment of killing so that the animal knows that its life is being taken in God's name. Um, secondly, when fixed procedures are followed when evaluating halal practices, for example, the evaluation procedures take on the character of ritual themselves because they're, they're fixed in time and in sequence. The third sense of ritual that we can use here is when these procedures take on a performative character such that they are seen by others as changing the status of the, of the object. What wasn't halal or, or haram becomes marked as halal through these ritual procedures. Now I want to talk about this question of the performativity of halal inspections. And I'm going to focus mainly on, on one example because this, is, this, is, this could take very long otherwise. And this would be uh, the Dutch, uh, one, one of the two Dutch certifiers that I've been following. How do inspectors prove in the two senses of the word, both try and demonstrate, the halal quality of an object? especially a foodstuff. And here I'll focus on halal correct in, in the Netherlands. Proving halal requires trying and failing to de detect pollution, the enemy of purity. But how do halal bodies prove the its absence? How do you prove the absence of pollution? One approach is to establish change of chains of purity by tracing upwards and backwards from a current product along the lines, the chains of production and transportation of its components until some recognized source of purity assurance is reached. 
So you, you go upwards from something you're, you're, you're inspecting, upwards through the chains of production that have led to that, that good. At this point, the history of the tracing becomes a trust device that freezes the temporal sequence to mark the halal quality of the object having been established. So you, you work up these chains, you come to a source of, of, insur of assurance of the halal quality of something, a trust device, and at that point, you no longer have to inspect or interrogate or work up the chains. You stop at that point and say, this uh, trusted, trusted uh, establishment of halal quality, now we can just take for granted. It becomes a trust device. Now, although most attention has been focused on halal issues surrounding animal slaughter, other products, in fact, provide greater challenges to claims of purity, and in particular, products that include enzymes, flavorings, and coloring agents, such as cheeses or beverages. In 2017-2018, my initial visits to a company, a Leiden-based Dutch halal auditing service, Halal Correct, were to a French fry producer, another potato factory, and a cheese distributor. No, not at all abattoirs. In visits to French and Dutch services more broadly, I encountered the greatest desires to preserve secrecy regarding beverages. Contamination from enzymes or from flavor supplements were discussed more than was the possibility of pork contamination. This is contrary to what most people assume about the certification of halal. In my cheese and fries visits, I joined two-person teams from Halal Correct. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you a little detail about how these certifiers work, uh, uh, and, then, and then we'll go back to more general concerns. The teams held what they called a desk audit, and then they, they followed a shop floor audit, so two stages to the inspections. On two occasions of my visits, the desk auditor was Yossi, the young Indonesian woman I mentioned earlier, and uh, the shop floor inspections were done by Aziz, a young Dutch Moroccan man. On the third visit, a Dutch Surin Surinamese auditor, Imran, accompanied Yossi. And indeed, this, this multinational composition of the inspection services was typical. I, I encountered many Indonesians working in this area because of the importance of the Malaysian and Indonesian uh, members of the big four, the, the, uh, uh, the state inspection services in those countries. Yossi, the Indonesian auditor, had recently arrived in the Netherlands with degrees in microbiology and food sciences, from the latter from Hent in the Netherlands. She audits processed foods, spices, cheeses, and energy bars, so far working with companies in the Netherlands and Belgium. <clears throat> she does not inspect abattoirs, does not, doesn't want to go ever into an abattoir. Aziz and Imran work as Sharia auditors, which means that they listen and watch for practices that might be in conflict with the rules governing halal. Both people also inspect abattoirs, Aziz and Imran. In May 2017, I accompanied Yossi and Aziz on a visit to Vika, a company located in the so south, south of the Netherlands. Vika had decided two years previously to get halal certification so they could sell processed goods to Malaysia, Indonesia, and to Muslims in the Netherlands. And after working, looking around, they decided to contract with Halal Correct. Today, Vika produces 600 to 700 distinct products, of which several dozen are certified as halal. The team began with the desk audit in which the auditor, Yossi, worked with software allowing her to trace elements up, upstream from Vika to earlier products or to their original sources and to trace the methods by which they were transported to Vika. So, for example, a block of cheese can appear at Vika after a previous stage of assembling several different food components. Yossi identified substances that posed lower or higher risks of contamination. She follows chains of objects, looking for potential contamination by going upstream from the shop floor to suppliers of an article and checks for halal certif certificates that may have been given along the way. She chooses which ingredients to pursue further by considering the relative risk due to the condition of its, produ of its production. Oils, for example, are low risk. I didn't know that because uh, due to the, uh, because they're thought of as a naturally occurring object whereas cheese are higher risk because of the presence of one or more enzymes, which may have been created from or been, been in contact with pigs or cattle. Indeed, the company had given her a list of such higher risk ingredients. This is, this is the company, Vika, that they're inspecting. Those ingredients that are synthetic carry low risk and she does not pursue them. Meats present the highest risk 
uh, not because of the complexity, but because of the risk of contamination at different stages of production. A poorly cleaned line at the abattoir, or the mixing of different meats, halal and non-halal, in a shop or in a truck. AOC asked for the specification of the entire load in a truck carrying halal foodstuff. What are all the things that were carried along with the halal products? Was everything in the truck halal? What was carried in the previous load? And was the truck properly clean between these two loads? For the VICA audit, she only traced one shipment back from the truck, the truck's run carrying the halal uh, load to the audited company. So she has, by, by necessity, she has to sample. She can't uh, inspect every single uh, uh, truck load. She, she, chose, she chose one to look at in detail. At this plant, there are dedicated halal lines, which raises the overall level of concern. Sorry, there are no dedicated halal lines. Uh, the plant addresses this concern in several ways. Cheese lines are never used for pork. Aziz asked if the plant sent samples to outside labs to check for contaminants, most likely traces of non-halal meat that had escaped the cleaning process. The plant does not do so, but has in-house DNA testing kits. However, they've never used them because they believe that, this can rely, that they can rely on their own procedures. Halal, Aziz voiced his skepticism, but with a largely non-halal plant, non -halal plant like a really could keep all sources of contamination away. During the desk audit, as Yossi was working up the chain of certificates, she would stop when she reached a prior a level of prior certification, which is, is mo in most cases was not from Halal Correct. As she later explained to me, of the 30 or so auditing bodies in the Netherlands, 30 Halal auditing bodies, Halal Correct accepts certificates of products from another audit body only if it, it has done a meta audit of their procedures or uh, she knows how they work and finds their auditing procedures sufficiently rigorous. The Halal Correct auditors say that they trust four major meta-audit bodies. So these are, these are bodies that, that audit the auditors. The, the Indonesian LP POM, and this is in Bogor, has validated Halal Correct's procedures since 2015 when they began visiting auditing bodies and inviting auditors to attend training sessions at LP, at LP POM headquarters in Bogor. Malaysia's Jakim and the Gulf-based GAC, the Gulf Accredita Accreditation Council, <clears throat> uh, are the next most mentioned. Rounding out the list of the big four is the WHFC, the World Halal Food Council in Jakarta, whose activities are less clear. Yossi called these the big four. So note two of them are in Indonesia, one is in Malaysia, one is in the Gulf. When Halal Correct is carrying out a desk audit and they come to an article or ingredient that has already been certified as halal by another audit body, and when that body has been approved by one of the big four, then HC accepts it at face value. For example, I, I've noticed that very often another Dutch audit body, the HVV, Halal Fooding and Futsal, or Halal Feed and Food Inspection Authority, shows up as a provider of halal cert certificates. Yossi explained that they trust HVV, HVV because their, their audit technique is accepted by these big four. So uh, Halal Correct does not audit uh, HVV, but the fact that audit that HVV is accepted by the big four leads Halal Correct to say, okay, we also accept uh, certificates from this body. So in, in those cases, Halal Correct does not need to pursue the origins of that particular element further upstream, up the chain. But other audit bodies do not receive these endorsements. For example, for meat products, all bodies that accept stunning of animals, such as HQC, their main competitor in the Netherlands, halal quality control, uh, and uh, they're, they're, they're a major rival with HC. HC prides itself on being more uh, rigorous and stringent than HQC. So they, <clears throat> they, um, they usually don't accept their endorsements, HQC's endorsements, as sufficient. They, they want to look into them further or go further upstream. The circle of audit bodies that accepts each other's findings and certificates thus allows a rather rapid desk audit, permitting Yossi to ask about a wide range of ingredients, such as flavorings. Audit bodies also specialize. For example, the Brussels-based Halal Food Council of Europe, these names start, they, they all sound alike, it's very confusing. Anyway, this is in Brussels, grants certificates for packaging, including foil wrap and the plastic wrap used for the cheese blocks sent from uh, Nazca to Vika. Packaging raised no concerns at Vika, but elsewhere it has done so. 
For example, halal correct audits tea and coffee companies who tend to forget that tea bags include the paper and the string attached to the bag that usually fall into the cup and they must be audited. Or whitening agents, fake cream, might only be perceived and tested on the occasion of a second audit. Halal Correct ends audit activities when the trucks leave a plant for distribution. They don't audit beyond that. But in other directions, it is trying to explore broader dimensions of halal. We face Muslim consumers who think of halal food as if it were simply a diet option and do not pay attention to the deeper meanings, Yossi told me. She also explained that they were thinking about effects of production on the environment and whether halal can be sustainable or uh, bio because bio good, uh, uh, sustainable goods, use fewer activities, fewer additives. The director of Halal Correct, Ben Ali Salah, has started to explore what could be thought of as eco halal. For example, being cared with their, their mothers, because that is a good, taib practice. It is better for mother and calf. Science can confirm what God said to us, she told me, Yossi, and the reasoning can all be in the reverse direction too, that we look at what science says and then look for evidence in the Quran and Hadith. It is God who tells us how to slaughter, she added, even though his word can be much later confirmed by science. For example, that halal methods of slaughter reduce pain. Halal Correct is growing. They add about five new client companies each year. Indeed, in late 2017, they began an energetic campaign to find new clients and asked me to stop work, uh, lest a new client find my presence odd and disturbing. But in April 2018, I was welcomed back with the news that the company concerned that the company concerned that the Dutch government would soon make it harder to export halal certified meats had established new bases in Nairobi and Poland, and that they had wanted to embargo this news until everything was settled. So they were preparing for a possible evacuation from the Netherlands to uh, to Kenya and Poland and setting up shop there, should that be uh, required in the future. So again, the emphasis in the Dutch case is really not about the Netherlands per se. They happen to be in the Netherlands, but they, what they do is they, they run an export business with certification from foreign uh, auditors, the big four. Okay, now I wanna talk about the relation of certificates to trust. Successfully completed the two activities of tracing and inspecting the two audits that we just discussed, led the auditors to renew the certificate of halal for VICA. That certificate in turn will be sent or shown to Dutch exporters, Dutch purchasers, and eventually to consumers, foreign importers, and possibly foreign purchasers or consumers. Of course, the commodity chains can be even more complex than described here, described here, with other agents also playing a role in embassies, customs offices, or in the form of government inspectors in importing countries. But unless there are further direct tests of samples of the products, it's their certificate and not the materiality of the product that is the proof of the product's quality. And this is, this is why this is a good example of a trust device or a judgment device. But trust remains necessary to proving halal. And at several junctures. For a business, trust starts with sharing company data, albeit with a confidentiality agreement, and extends to trusting or betting that the audit will be accepted by importers and other clients. For the auditors, trust is in believing that the company does what it says and records and does not move objects around on the shop floor or forge records, forge records between visits and that other audit services have done their job when they issued certificates. That is why auditors also assess the trustworthiness of the, plas the plant managers. For example, it worried Aziz at Vika deeply that pork powder was stored on the shop floor and that its presence had not been previously declared by Vika. What else might they not tell us, he asked me. He asked me. There's another dimension to this chain of cert certification and trust, namely that the issuance of certificates is indeed a performative, which once it, once it occurs, changes the world. As far as the many actors who await the product downstream, the exporters, importers, consumers, and officials, the matter is settled. The cheese is halal. And indeed, from this point of view, it is the certificate that is the point as it is the certificate that makes it possible for the actors involved to sell, export, import, and consume. The certificate now becomes the key trust device in the subsequent history of the product. Once properly issued, it embodies the performative act and blocks further questioning about the purity of the production process uh, or the accuracy of laboratory tests. Of course, this purity 
and accuracy could be challenged, thus leading to a scandal that threatens the entire system. Although scandal rumors circulate here and there, a public scandal threatens the entire system of procedures and devices, and actors tend to stop just short of going public. It's in nobody's interest to publicly declare your mistrust in these procedures if you're part of the procedures. But now Muslims depend to a greater extent on trust in the certi certification process and may be more skeptical of certificates and of their local butcher. This is the paradox that I mentioned before. Let me just quote uh, a, a little tiny bit of a, a rather long focus group that uh, we held in Den Haag in 2017 with a number of uh, women who knew each other who were discussing these issues, issues of how they know what they buy is halal. So uh, I'll just mention uh, several actors in their exchange. A woman named Hakima. Hakima said, for years, I bought chicken fillets from the Turkish, Turkish butcher on the corner. This week, for the first time, I bought chicken from the Albert Heijn. That is a, that is a, a large uh, chain uh, uh, food store in the Netherlands. It had a halal label on it with a date and information on where and when the meat was processed. Because I could read all the information there, I came to trust it. If I had complaints, I know where to go. With the butcher, I always have questions about, is it fresh? He always says, it's fine, but you cannot trace it or read anything on a label. You trust not only in the butcher or the, the location, the fact that it's in the neighborhood, but also from information on the container. So, so her notion of trust has shifted from personal knowledge of the butcher to something she can read and verify. But uh, uh, Allah said, Allah, another woman in, the, in this discussion, I've always bought meat from a Muslim butcher shop. And once I asked about a certificate, when he showed it, the date was incorrect. I then called the certificate office and it appeared that the shop worked with a non-halal slaughterhouse that destroyed my trust in the butcher. Since then, I checked not only the label and the certificate, but also if the surroundings are trustworthy, if the butcher is trusted and known in the community, now I buy our meat where our neighbor also buys theirs. The owner prays in our mosque. He's known and trusted in our community, his family. And the atmosphere, the milieu is often cited as well. Uh, a woman named Alia. A halal label or certificate is for me not always enough. It also matters where the product is, pur is purchased. And Albert Hein is not a halal place. So I then associate the product not with halal, regardless of the label. We also discussed at length the question of, of Heineken non-alcoholic beer. And Alia said, you link beer to a certain lifestyle. So even if, even, even, even if it's quite clear there's no alcohol in the, in the beer, this association makes it distasteful for her. Habiba said, yes, if you called it something other than beer, I would gladly drink it. She went on to say, it also has to do with, uh, for example, Mecca food is better if the products could be bought in the mosque. Mecca food is a brand of... Um, uh, Dutch, typical Dutch foods, croquettes and that sort of thing, which are uh, certified as halal. Mecca food is better if the products would be bought at, in the mosque. Next best would be at the Muslim butcher shop, and only after that at a non-Islamic shop or supermarket, because then you reach the Islamic target group directly at trusted locations, places where trust is present. All right, so this is quite interesting. We have trust associated with the behavior of a butcher, or another person. We have trust associated with, uh, with a label that one can read and verify. And we have trust associated with characteristics of a place, a milieu. Does it, does it promote general trust in the object? So trust has become more complicated. It hasn't gone away just because there's halal certification, the, the, the requirement of trust. But also for many of the Muslim actors in these networks, it is important to highlight the Islamic character of procedures and the judgment device. Just as the consumer trusts the local butcher because he frequents the mosque, the personal piety of auditors can become an important reason for some consumers to accept their certificates or not to do so. So may confidence in the religious bases for the new audit services. Retaining this religious base requires that all auditing be seen as religious in nature. It cannot be seen as directly and only scientific. Science informs knowledge about religious status, halal or not halal, but pronouncing something to be halal is a religious determination and a religious performative act, not a scientific one. Of course, this point becomes even more important to emphasize if the plant is run by non-Muslims who are seen correctly as having an entirely instrumental relationship to the audit. The owners of Vika, they're not Muslims. They don't care about halal per se. They care about being able to export their products to countries that demand a halal certificate. 
This issue arose in the audits I accompanied. FICA cheese plant managers were able to give quick responses to all questions by, from, from Aziz and, and Yossi by using their own database, which allows them to follow the trajectory of each article. However, both Yossi and Aziz asked them to highlight the Islamic sources of some steps, and indeed to create a new PowerPoint slide that would list all the procedures that are carried out in order that the product be halal. So on a separate slide that would, that would uh, underscore that, that this is about halal quality. It was not enough to change procedures. It was important that the reasons for doing so, taking step X or Y, was because Islam required it. And it's, it, it's in this sense, among others, that I think we can consider this to be a question of Islamic ritual. They explained that if halal were reduced to an extra step here or a cautionary note there, we would lose sight of the true sources and criteria for properly producing food, namely from God. As it was, the slide presentation on the plant's procedures made no mention of halal qualities. Uh, as he said, once I give the responsibilities away, then all you can do is trust in someone else's intentions. Now, there are a number of other qualities regarding the Islamic, uh, other, other issues regarding the Islamic quality of halal procedures that also have to do with ritual requirements. For example, are the, are the slaughtermen Muslims? Do they say the bismillah when they're slaughtering? To emphasize that this is, this is uh, 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 for God and under God's rules that they're taking a life. Is the animal facing the qibla, uh, the direction of prayer, when killed? Is the, uh, is the bismillah heard by the animal? So it knows, the animal knows that its uh, life is being taken in God's name. A major issue, which I can talk about, but I, I won't go into it in detail, it regards stunning. Uh, and so stunning by uh, many, many, uh, many Muslims involved in halal production or, or consumption regard stunning as improper because there's a danger of killing the animal. And because for many, this, the animal should be conscious when it's killed in order to hear the bismillah. Um, and this, this issue comes up uh, again and again, and it, it creates a, a dilemma for, uh, for many. For example, Mecca Foods, which is trying to appeal to a broad public, but also trying to make sure that its quality as an Islamic uh, food producer <coughs> is, is recognized, uh, uh, is, in a, is in a quantity. They've told me this about whether or not, to, how to talk about stunning, uh, because um, that stunning can symbolize for many Muslims a uh, question of strictness. Are you, are you making sure that the animal's alive despite having been stunned prior to, to being killed? But uh, it's seen as, as by, by many others as going against Dutch notions of welfare. So this presents a dilemma in marketing. Do you uh, downplay stunning uh, or, do you, uh, or, or do you play up the procedures taken to make sure the animal is alive when killed? So um, as all goes back to these questions of uh, what Muslims do when migrating to new lands to create a sense of home, create a sense of of, of living as a good Muslim, and, and how, in, in what way do those criteria of living as a good Muslim change? And I, uh, the example I've given here, among other things, emphasizes that there's, there can be a new demand for explicitness in rules, which poses new questions and, and challenges. But what's common in, in all these efforts, which I think is also a, an integral part of your own project, is the importance of offering reassurance, protection, of making home in a foreign land, even if this involves guarantees by very distant places such as Indonesia and Malaysia. So as I look out over these changes, and these are fast changing uh, situations, the global and the local are being reconfigured uh, at once and together. With your project, I do hope that specific features of making home through ritual will be even better known. And I look forward to your questions and to further discussions with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for your fascinating uh, talk. Uh, you touched several of the topics uh, we are working uh, with. So thank you also for uh, adapting. This is speaking about adaptation. <laughs> adapting your your concerns with uh, with our uh, our uh, guidelines uh, in our research, main, uh, namely the, the concern with public spaces, the with institutions, and with uh, and with the processes of homemaking, our our main uh, lines of research. And I, I, I'm sure. You you aroused some of uh, uh, of the of questions and the curiosities of uh, our researchers, 
And so um, you can ask uh, your questions to Professor Bob. I have some, but I will uh, do them uh, later. Thank you. So the stage is uh, is uh, of the audience. Everybody can uh, can ask questions freely. Think. Domenico, are you are you monitoring? Are you calling on people? You will you will do the monitoring of the question. Um, I if think. I can. Uh, that I can't, I can't see, I can't see everybody. Yeah. Domenico, start you with your question. Open okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, something uh, uh, that I didn't mention uh, when I introduced your uh, your work, uh, but I already already knew you were uh, working about was the another tension. It is the one between uh, uh, science and religion. And uh, in, in your talk, uh, the, 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 the relation between technical processes and uh, ritual processes are, uh, was fascinating for, your, uh, uh, for how you explain them. So you must have done some um, very deep uh, observation, participation in that. Uh, so about this, I, I, I had a, a curious about something, namely, um, are uh, uh, halal products just for Muslims, or can they be? Um, the, I mean, they can can they be? Um, but, uh, I mean, ideally for non-Muslims, namely the institutions that uh, certificate halal uh, have some relationship with uh, uh, the national institutions in Europe that. Uh, um, uh, certificate the, the uh, scientific or technical uh, um, or um, the, the happiness of, uh, of products, namely in France or in Britain or in the Netherlands, uh, do institutions uh, of, uh, about food or medicines uh, think about, uh, think about uh, the halal products as something that can be consumed by non-Muslims? Mm. So this yes. is... Uh, <laughs> The, the interaction of, uh, the, of the institutions. Yes, very, very definitely. And uh, so halal food that is uh, uh, sold as food in Britain must comply with British food standards. Uh, the, sim the same thing in France and the same thing in, uh, in, 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 in the Netherlands. And there is more or less uh, co uh, collaboration, I think is part of the interest of your question. There's more or less collaboration between the halal committees on the one hand and the, the national uh, food inspection groups on the other. I, I, my general sense is that there's much more in, uh, in, in, in Britain, there's more active collaboration in Britain, and this has to do with the domestic uh, focus, I think, uh, of the British uh, halal inspection services and, and the close relationship between the producers and the inspectors. So they're, 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 in the case of the halal monitoring committee, uh, the one that I've, I've been following most closely, but also in the case of others, <coughs> other uh, uh, halal uh, groups in, in Britain, there's always been this close working relationship with, because there's a close working, working relationship with the producers about their overall strategies, uh, this also leads to uh, collaboration and communication with the, uh, the, the broad uh, uh, food inspection services. Um, I, I, I'm sure that's true everywhere, but of course it's different if, if a company is mainly producing for uh, for export. Then there's a different set of, of rules and regulations, and there's much more concern about those uh, uh, than, than there is about uh, you know active collaboration with the Dutch services. It, it obviously has to be there, but it seems in my own uh, experience to be uh, a bit less important. Then there are uh, other concerns that I, I alluded to here about uh, uh, beyond the level of basic uh, uh, health and safety requirements. Um, there's also these uh, concerns about uh, European certification of something as, 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 uh, as ecological, uh, or uh, uh, the questions of GMO, the legal status of GMOs, which present new challenges to halal products as, as well. Um, but but it's, it, this is a, these, these are relationships that are uh, dynamic, they're constantly changing. And I expect to see probably in the future 
a greater acceptance eventually of, of halal food products by, for example, uh, the European uh, agencies that can pass on the, uh, the, 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 the bio, the ecological status of a product. But we'll see. Thank you for the question. Yeah, and, and thank you for uh, your explanation. So uh, we have uh, uh, two questions from uh, uh, Giovanni Cordova. Uh, Giovanni, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, and I'm very glad to meet uh, Professor Bowen, even if virtually. And I thank you, Domenico, for Copertino for having organized this moment of discussion. And just a quick question, because I was thinking. Uh, when uh, you were speaking, Professor Bowen, to uh, also to our cities and towns, uh, especially in uh, southern Italy, where there is an historical presence of uh, North African people. And uh, during recent years, uh, uh, we have been witnessing uh, migration from Asia, for example, Bangladesh, and uh, new poles of uh, halal consumption, uh, butchers, markets uh, have been spreading. And um, do you think that uh, the halal pole, the creation of halal poles for consumption uh, can be considered also as a way to uh, alter hierarchies, uh, perceptions, social perceptions and uh, social relations within Muslim communities uh, where I, I repeat, uh, for example, Bangladeshi people are uh, um, inferior, quantitatively speaking, uh, rather than uh, uh, North African people. But uh, in uh, cities uh, like, uh, I think, uh, Messina, but also in, uh, in Sicily, in other parts of uh, Sicily, uh, all, more and more shops, uh, markets, butchers are uh, founded and created by Bangladeshi people, and uh, they are maybe they are more than uh, uh, North Africans. So uh, this is also a quality that uh, um, sh halal dispositive institution shares with ritual. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> so your question concerns the shifting uh, ethnic uh, ethnic identities of the leaders in halal distribution in the shops, for example. And that's it's very interesting. It, it will be very interesting for uh, for you, I believe, to to see whether this in, in involved in this is a a different set of uh, what I was calling meta audit uh, bodies in my in my talk. So uh, who so starting from always working from the ground up, uh, those who frequent those shops, I imagine they are of diverse ethnic origins. They would have there'd be Bangladeshis, but there'd also be North Africans and others. Um, and it might be very interesting to see. Uh, just to, to observe and to speak with various consumers about their attitude towards the halal, the, the, the halalness, the, the extent of knowledge of halal uh, and reliability and trust in, uh, in, in, these, uh, in, in the Bangladeshi proprietors to be observing halal rules. But whether, that, whether, whether that's a problem because of the ethnic difference or whether the shared uh, Islamic identity serves to bridge that difference. And I would, I would expect to see that the, I, I would expect, I guess, that the, the personal piety of the butcher would uh, be of, of great importance in bridging the ethnic difference. That could be a hypothesis. And I don't know if it's true, but it'd be very interesting to explore. Thank you. Domenico. Thank you, Professor Baum. And then uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Professor Palumbo. Okay. Uh, I, I was thinking that anthropology is a very, very strange job, you know, because I was expecting to hear something about, just something about Muslim immigration and so on, and I found a, a wonderful uh, presentation which resonated with some words I did some years ago on the construction, on the construction of uh, global taxonomic systems, so, so systems that categorize the global, trying to create ethnic or national or uh, stereoty stereotypes differences. So thank you very much. In this frame, I have two questions. Uh, one is not directly a question, it, it concerns the notion of public space. If I understand, you are working on a national or global public space. 
and uh, the specificity of uh, Italian public space. Uh, Giovanni Cordova, I think, was thinking to something like this: is that there is no public, not, there is not only one public space. There are many, many public spaces which are very differentiated among themselves and which have very different historical roots. So our problem is to uh, mediate between the level that you are working with, with our differentiated public spaces. And this is one of the interests, but also the difficulties of working in Italy, not only on migration, but on the public spaces in Italy. Second question, and which is, and this is a question directly. Uh, don't you have the, which is the relation between the process of stereotypization, which is implied in the, this kind of uh, <clears throat> creating a certificate and uh, the, the practice? So I think that this system are creating a, another level of fixing of the practices, which are uh, uh, connected to the global and the migration situation. And then you have uh, a level of fixing that you have also uh, treated in your in your presentation, which is the ritual fixing, and both this kind of fixing does doesn't create the risk of homogene uh, or creating an uh, homogenization of practices, not only between uh, imposing or uh, uh, shifting from. Uh, Sri Lanka to uh, from a, a nation to an uh, or better from a, a, a Middle East Middle Eastern to a nation practice, but also uh, in per se. So the process implies a stereotypization and the fixings of the food practices. And uh, I would like to know what do you think about this this effect of the systems of a classification. Thank you very much for those questions. <clears throat> uh, uh, the first, uh, it was really, as you said, an observation on very different forms of public space. Uh, I think this is this is really important. I just I, I wrote an article once uh, with a a, Fr <clears throat> a, a French colleague, uh, Christophe Bertossi, looking <clears throat> at the different attitudes in France towards uh, being visibly Muslim in a hospital versus being visibly Muslim in a in a public school. These are both uh, state public spaces, but there are very different rules and, and attitudes about the two, um, which have to do with the, the, the degree of visibility, among other things. That a public school is highly visible to everybody at all times, whereas a hospital, much of it is really closed off. You know, rooms are not open for anyone to just walk into them. So that there, was, there, was, there was much greater uh, opportunity for, for women who wanted to wear head coverings, for example, to do so while working in a hospital <laughs> and working in a school. So sometimes, yeah, these, these, these micro, and this is the same, you know, same country, same ideology, um, <clears throat> these micro differences in different kinds of public spaces are, are fascinating to, uh, to look into. Um, and and even, so even to go back to that example that I mentioned, the Minister of the Interior, Gerard Darm Darmanin's combination, condemnation of uh, advertising foods as halal on, or shelves as halal in, in supermarkets had to do not with the uh, availability in supermarkets of halal foods. It had to do with the publicity given to the halal status and the sense that he had that uh, advertising a shelf of, of, of goods in, in the supermarket as halal meant that these were not for all French people. And a supermarket, because it's public space, it's, it's, of course, it's, it's private, but it's public space in the sense of access to it, uh, is, is, is thereby doing damage to the French uh, goal of having everybody treated as equal, uh, equally French or equally uh, resident and, and uh, serving a similar set of uh, goals in, in France. So that's something that we wouldn't find in, in, in most other countries. And uh, you know, just, it brings, brings us back to the, the importance of, of looking precisely at what these spaces are, are like. Then, of course, there's all sorts of other examples, which I won't go into, but um, different ways in which mosques are configured to be more or less identifiable as mosques, depending on the particular conditions at the time, whether it's, it's better to advertise one's Islamic character or not. And of course, this can also change over, uh, over time. Um, 
there's a notion in France of something called a cathedral mosque, which is very, very much advertising its Islamic character. It's a mosque that's meant to look like a, a Catholic cathedral. And indeed, the treatment of those mosques very much parallels the, the treatment of of key Catholic cathedrals. They're given a special place in state regulations. Uh, they, uh, for even in the halal uh, uh, arena, they're, they're, they're seen as privileged partners for dealing with halal food uh, questions. And there's, there's both this kind of calc on Catholic cathedrals, uh, but also this, this privilege that the state can bestow on certain mosques and not on others, which is a very French characteristic. So uh, anyway, I think that that uh, investigation of, of publicness, mm -hmm. different kinds of publicness is very fruitful. So I look forward to hearing much more about that in the future. Um, now, the second, uh, the second uh, question, um, let me start uh, with an answer and, 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 then, and then see if this is the direction uh, of, your, of your question. I wasn't sure whether you were asking more about how, for example, Bangladeshi food preferences might change become standardized, or the, the ways in which uh, certification requires standardization itself uh, in, in, and in, in different countries where you will have different, uh, different practices and, uh, and, and not necessarily easily standardizable. Um, uh, I, I don't have much to say about the first one, you know, do tastes become standardized? Uh, I, I, I'm not, that's not something I really picked up on, but maybe I'm, you know, if I certainly I welcome a follow up on that on that aspect aspect of it. Uh, the other the other version of this uh, I found fascinating, which is <clears throat> that the um, uh, the big four uh, and just focus on the the Indonesian and the Malaysian state certifying bodies when they're serving as meta auditors when they come to uh, plants in uh, in say in, in in the Netherlands or elsewhere uh, to check on the audit procedures that are that are already in place. So halal correct is is uh, inspecting a, a plant, uh, and and the people from the Malaysian agency come in to see if halal correct is following the standards that the Malaysian body uh, uh, advocates and holds services to. There's there's a, there's a long book of these, you know. So for example, uh, here's the voltage at which the the, the electric baths that would uh, uh, that would stun chickens has to be set out. They have that sort of specific, specific rules set out. And, it's, and it is, is uh, uh, supposed to be the, the role of the, the local inspector to follow the Malaysian standards when inspecting a, a Dutch plant. They're supposed to take the Malaysian book and say, okay, uh, looking at, the, at, at, the, uh, at all, all the meters, is the, is, are the amps and volts correct? And there's somebody, when I was there, there's somebody coming in uh, every uh, couple of minutes to check and indeed to take a, a photograph of the, uh, the the meters that measure the the amps and the and the voltage, the problem is that uh, the the uh, which, what the, what the goal of all this well there's two goals of all this one goal is standardization, and, th and this is also a goal of the Malaysian body having a great deal of worldwide control over a halal certification, but the the explicit goal the the the, 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 the ritual goal the more, more important goal in terms of the objectives of, of halal is to make sure that the, the level of electricity is such that the chickens are stunned so they don't feel pain when their throats are being cut. That's why you have stunning in the first place, but they also have to recover from the stunning. They can't, they, they may not die because if they die, then they've been killed by a non-halal means. Halal does not allow for killing of chickens in an electric bath. It's got to be done with a knife, saying the bismillah, pointed in the direction of the Qibla, of Mecca, et cetera. So it's the job of the inspector, among other things, to uh, make sure that this is the case, that the chickens are stunned, but they don't die. So he, what he does, he's, he, you know, he, he knows the plant well, he knows exactly uh, how, the, how their ritual bath works, but he, he still, every time he goes, he'll test. He'll take some chickens off the line, he'll throw them over on the table, and he'll wait to see if they recover from the stunning process. And if they don't, he'll say, ah, we need to turn down the elect electricity a bit, and if they all do survive, then that's fine. Then he can approve it. But he'll do it, you know, maybe uh, six hours later. He'll do it again. He's constantly monitoring this thing. The problem is that the numbers that he finds works at, uh, at a particular plant, based on his experience, are not the same as the numbers that the Malaysians bring with them in the book. So uh, there, there's, the standardization would have the, the wrong effect <laughs> if it were followed. So what he has to do is somehow 
finesse this uh, decalage, this, uh, co this contradiction, by basically showing the Malaysians what he, what he does. He shows the Malaysians what he's been doing. He shows them his records. He keeps careful records of the chickens that he takes off the line to test, making sure that they recover. He shows them his records. They see those. They also see the, uh, the voltages and the ampers and, and they, they, um, they, they, they know that these are not the same as what they have in their books, but they say nothing because they understand that he's trying to have an Islamically correct uh, result, even though it doesn't, it doesn't fit their own standards that they're trying to impose around the world. So do, do I fail if I say that the direction of the standard, the process goes from ritual to standardization and from standardization to people? Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I don't see any more questions, but but I have another one. It is uh, um, related with the idea of, um, of the halal certification as a global discourse. Uh, uh, so uh, that can uh, that can arouse uh, uh, et ethnical distinctions among uh, migrants in, uh, in a given country. Well, in Italy, uh, the main Muslim community is that of uh, Albanians that have uh, some specific uh, um, uh, practices that are very different from other Muslims. <coughs> For instance, uh, some uh, some Alba many Albanians. Uh, despite the fact that they are Muslims, they, they eat pork and they don't consider that as uh, something haram. And so for them, uh, learning uh, about uh, the global uh, idea of halal can be uh, something uh, that, 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 that they can learn in Italy. Hmm? So uh, uh, they approach uh, here this, uh, this kind of discourse. Uh, so for them, it can be something that starts as something very intellectual, as you said before, an intellectual discourse about halal. Then it uh, uh, it comes to practices. Um, but besides the ethnical distinctions that can come also from uh, uh, the different uh, um, uh, the different uh, um, uh, countries where the, cert the, the, the certification bodies come from, there is also I, I wanted to know if there is something related to uh, class distinction or socioeconomic of uh, of a Muslim uh, of Muslim of, of Muslims that uh, um, say mm, uh, trust in uh, um, in a uh, technical procedures or personal relationships to understand what is what is halal and what is not. Namely, I, don't know, I, I, I can imagine that um, uh, uh, a higher social economical level uh, on an educational level uh, can uh, um, can be more uh, respondent to a technical uh, uh, kind of certification and uh, and on the opposite side a lower uh, label can be can be more uh, uh, trusting uh, with with personal to, i mean can trust more in personal certification and personal relationships uh, am i wrong uh, thinking that what do i think of that it, that that certainly makes sense and, and indeed, we, we see looking at uh, you know at the cases I know about in Europe, <clears throat> I've looked at that the um, uh, very often students play a, a, a really important role. Not even necessarily students of Islamic matters, but among migrants, people who who were already already had college degrees, maybe advanced degrees uh, beyond that, in their countries of origin, take on very specific roles when they when they migrate, uh, and and these can. The, depending on the importance of these populations, this can have an, an important impact on the direction the country takes. So, for example, in France, the leadership of what's called the, U, the UOIF, which is, which is the, uh, the largest and oldest and sort of mainstream organization to which Muslim, many Muslim leaders uh, belong, was, was founded and continues to be uh, run by people who had uh, higher, higher education in the places from which they came, largely North Africa. It's, it's, it's a North African-run organization. But even within the North African populations, there is a particular uh, pre preponderance of Tunisians in, uh, in higher education. And this has to do with their uh, exile from the country at a certain time. So many of the Tunisians who, were, who had already graduated from university uh, came to France, or they pursued their university education 
in France. And so uh, the, the people who set up Islamic uh, in institutions of higher education in France are overwhelmingly of a Tunisian background. And that gave a certain uniformity and stability to the content of the teaching, uh, because they're all from one, one madhab, one Islamic uh, school. Uh, they tend to be very open to the idea of the, uh, of, of the, uh, the, the goals of Sharia, Maqasada um, Sharia, as, as, a, as a, a term with which you're probably familiar, the idea that, uh, yes, there's the Quran and the Hadith, but we also have to, because, because religion has to adapt to changing circumstances, we look for the, the, the objectives, the major objectives in, in, uh, in Islam, these, these uh, Maqasid, or from the, from the root Maqasid, which is a goal or objective, and, and, and we have to see how these major uh, objectives uh, can best be fulfilled now, which is a very, you know, it's a very flexible doctrine and it gives, gives rise to all sorts of new interpretations, but it's supported socially by the fact that there's this, there's this uniformity of origins of, uh, to some extent, class position, educational position uh, uh, among these leaders of uh, these Islamic influencers of opinion makers uh, at the higher level who come to France. And, and so this has a lot to do with this making uh, uh, rules explicit it has to do with the, the major public events that the Muslim communities put on, which is especially the annual meeting of the, the UOIF, uh, uh, where uh, prestigious thinkers are brought in from Muslim-majority countries to support this general view of how Islam ought to be uh, thought of. Now, there are, there are many other opinions in France uh, from different, different groups and different classes, but uh, until, uh, in, in, until now, they've been very much uh, uh, minoritized, that they're not they're not part of, of power structures. Uh, there's, the, there's, of course, the tablik, which has its own uh, goals and loyalties, and et cetera, and there, and there are others. And, and because France is France, <coughs> excuse me, France has attempted to um, or, or bring all these different groups together in a, in a, in a state-run council, which has no power, but uh, tries to sort of be a democratic representative body. It doesn't really do much. Uh, but uh, but anyway, so, the, so the, that's, that's, that's a very specific background to the opinion makers in, in France. In Britain, it's, it's, it's very different. In, in the Netherlands, it's very different again. Uh, and I, I, I mentioned a little bit that already. In, in Britain, uh, you, you've got, a, you've got a, a much, much more of a plurality of, uh, of affiliations. Um, and you've got a, um, a focus on, on, on commerce uh, that is, is, uh, re it refers back to networks of, of British migrants and, and especially uh, shopkeepers who moved from South Asia um, to uh, East Africa and, and, and were, were important networks of commerce uh, in East Africa for a long time until they were expelled and fled to Britain. And many of them settled around Leicester uh, in the Midlands. So Leicester is a center of, of pe people who are part of this migration stream, uh, this two-stage migration stream. And they came with very strong uh, commercial skills. They also often had high levels of Islamic education, but what really knit them together were these, these commercial skills. And they're the people who, uh, uh, with whom uh, the Halal Monitoring Committee works. The Halal Monitoring Committee uh, head, uh, the director himself had, had to learn additional South Asian languages to work most successfully with uh, all the people in his network of, 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 of businessmen. You know, something that from a French perspective would seem very odd, where you've got entirely Francophone, very high level Francophone discussions. So it's a very different sort of social network uh, um, of, of, of people who are of a or of, of, from a very highly successful, highly networked commercial background. So again, you know, the, the, the social histories of these dominant groups that sort of set the institutional tone in each country is very important for understanding how all these things are interpreted. Now the Albanian, Albanian question I know nothing about. I think it's fascinating, and it's a great case to uh, follow Albanian institutions or uh, institutions in in Italy that are uh, appealing to an Albanian uh, public to provide certain forms of Islamic education. What do they use? Uh, what sorts of uh, traditions do they advocate? How do they deal with these questions about the, the truth that you uh, raised? You know about uh, a, a radical uh, diversity of orientations towards what mo most people would take as sort of basic Islamic practices. I think that, that's a wonderful opportunity. Maybe some of you are already working on this, but I, I think that's, uh, that, that'll, that'll prove very interesting. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, thank you for your answer. Um, 
where uh, the, the, the matter is that uh, if I have, if I uh, if I uh, face my my topical research, thinking about your question in a former article, that can be Islam be France uh, be French. So is there a French Islam or is there an Islam in France? Well, as far as I have seen in Italy, there is no there is no Italian um, uh, Islam. I mean, there is no room for an Italian Islam. Here, Muslims think about themselves as Muslims, as global Muslims that live uh, mm -hmm. in Italy. Uh, and so... Yes, yeah, so Domenico, Domenico, what you say is very interesting and it's connected to the what I was trying to say uh, concerning the notion of public space. No? Uh, for this reason, we are trying as a project to look at the micro level where probably some kind of common public space is creating by now because i agree completely with you there is no italian public space for these differences not only muslim but also other differences yes hmm. yeah yeah uh, so we have another question from uh, francesco Donatelli. yes <clears throat> good afternoon hello thank you for uh, Thank you for your talk, uh, very interesting. Um, I, I am very curious about uh, the economic aspect of uh, uh, the, regula the halal regulation. I would like to know if you have uh, investigated the, the price of culture in this uh, specific uh, aspect, because I, I suppose that uh, all these uh, halal certificates um, they have a, a, an extra cost in the, in the in the price in the construction of the price of the the food and so uh, i would like to know something more if uh, there is a, a discord there is a, a, a conversation among uh, muslim people about uh, uh, the difference in in, uh, in in the cost of uh, of food of halal food and uh, uh, how the the regulation uh, produce uh, some extra code and what they think about it. Yes, thank you. That's a very, a very important area of research. There, there's, a, there's a fair amount of research on this, I believe. And by the way, there's, there, there's, there are tons of people, many, many people uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere um, in Malaysia also who, who do research on halal, uh, into all aspects of halal production, regulation, <coughs> technology of it, and including the economics of it. It's not something I've really looked into in any serious way. It, let me just make make one comment on this, which I find uh, useful. It, it comes from the, my my work in Britain with the Halal Monitoring Committee, where the director, as I mentioned, is very interested in the economic welfare of the network because this is also the this this will determine the economic welfare of his his organization. And and he's uh, he's always very attuned to the signaling function of price, the way that a higher price can signal higher quality, higher quality of the of the good and higher quality of the uh, the monitoring, the halal monitoring itself. So he's actually uh, somebody who thinks of price not just as a, a, a higher cost of the price of culture. I like I like your phrase very much, uh, but also as something where, you know, it's it's a judgment device. If you if you don't really know how to compare quality, you know, you're not really sure of of how to do that. Um, a higher price sometimes can be uh, can urge you to purchase that object rather than deter you from purchasing that object if it can be presented as signaling a higher attention to quality. That's the only maybe interesting comment I have. Otherwise, it's, it's a field I don't know uh, really much about. Okay, so I, I don't see anybody else, but if someone else wants to, to ask a question, we have some time, some minutes, uh, until the end of the, I mean, until it's supposed to end uh, of the webinar. Domenico, I would like just to add that something that if uh, John is interested in extending his comparative analysis also to Italy, and if he thinks that in some way we can collaborate or help him even if he wants to come in, uh, to make some kind of field work in Italy we will be very happy to 
to do this kind of intermediation. Thank you very much. That's a very generous uh, offer, and I, I appreciate that. That would be fascinating to do. We'll have to see how uh, you know, how we can expand our 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 person-to-person uh, -person relations uh, in in the what we hope is coming out of COVID era. But uh, I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Yeah, I subscribe to the, the invitation of Professor Palumbo. And so Thank if you, you decide to, to come to Italy, you, you're welcome. You, you can consider us as a, a father network of yours uh, for your research. Thanks very much. That's, that sounds very, uh, very exciting. And so if there is no more questions, I want just to once more thank you to Professor Bowen for uh, his, uh, his wonderful presentation and his uh, generous contribution to, to our project. Uh, thank you once more, Professor Bowen. <coughs> and, uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure uh, having this exchange with you. I learned a lot from your questions and from uh, your research. I, I look forward to further exchanges. Uh, uh, either you know in this fashion or in written fashion or or directly in uh, in Italy or elsewhere. Thanks very much for inviting me. Okay. Well. Ciao. Ciao. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Grazie. Buonasera a tutti. Buonasera a tutti. Ciao. 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 Buona Thank you. See you. Bene. Medico, siamo rimasti noi, no, se n'è andato Medico, vabbè. Ok. Mm -hmm. Ah, stop recording, ok, sì, sì, ok, cosa che succede?